Allô, on va commencer. Je parle pas très fort. On va commencer euh, aujourd'hui le, pour le séminaire. Juste, juste avant de, de donner la parole à Dr. Paul, je voudrais, euh, pour ceux qui sont dans le cours de séminaire, je pense que c'est la majorité d'entre vous, euh, je pense qu'il y avait eu quelques questions par rapport au, euh, au travail. Euh, fait que je voulais juste prendre quelques minutes pour en parler avec vous. Euh, le, le, ben, je n'ai pas beaucoup de choses additionnelles à vous dire. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans le plan de cours? Euh, sauf que c'est sûr que typiquement, le travail, souvent les gens vont prendre un sujet de, d'une conférence, puis ils vont faire un peu un relevé de littérature sur ce sujet-là, euh, soit avec les travaux de la personne qui a présenté ou de façon plus large. Euh, il y a aussi certaines personnes, qui, il y a des conférences qui, se, qui sont quand même connectées là, sur le plan scientifique. Donc, vous pouvez prendre une coupe de conférences puis faire un, sur la littérature là-dessus. Mais il y a d'autres personnes aussi dans les années passées qui, qui, qui voulaient pousser différemment, qui avaient d'autres idées. Euh, c'est pour ça qu'on a élargi le, le travail pour que ce ne soit pas juste un, 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 relevé, un relevé de littérature typique. Euh, ce, qu'on vous, ce qu'on vous suggère, c'est sûr que la grille d'évaluation que vous avez est plus euh, développée pour un travail typique. Euh, sauf que c'est fait très facilement, euh, si, on a, un, si on passe à un autre type d'idée comme ce qu'on a listé dans le plan de cours, c'est facilement adaptable aussi. Euh, si jamais vous voulez faire quelque chose qui, qui sort plus de l'ordinaire, vous n'êtes pas certain, justement, nous, ce qu'on vous suggère, c'est quand vous allez savoir sur quoi vous voulez travailler, euh, de contacter Cassandra ou Catherine, ou les deux. Puis, euh, idéalement, écrivez toujours à tout le monde, c'est plus facile, parce que de toute façon, on fait tout le temps des CC, puis là, on ne se ramasse pas à faire des CC, fait que ça, c'est une autre parenthèse, mais... Donc, euh, donc, écrivez pour voir, euh, pour voir si on peut soit pour avoir un rendez-vous ou d'écrire votre idée, puis on va vous dire, c'est oui ou... Fais pas attention, tu l'orientes comme ça, juste pour ça, pour être sûr que c'est, c'est, qu'on vous aide un petit peu puis qu'on vous guide. Euh, donc, euh, donc, c'est ça, fait que c'est... Je ne sais pas si, si ça, ça, ça vous aide ou ça vous rassure ou s'il y a des questions par rapport à ça. OK. Donc, euh, <rire> s'il y a des questions, de toute façon, n'hésitez pas à nous écrire sur Studium. Euh, puis... Euh, ou si vous nous écrivez un email, comme je disais, mettez tout le monde en CC. Donc, on va, on va aller avec la conférence d'aujourd'hui. Euh, un petit rappel, les conférences sont aussi sur Zoom. Donc, quand on est en personne ou sur Zoom, c'est toujours enregistré. Donc, on vous le rappelle parce que quand on est en personne, vous l'entendez, vous l'entendez pas là, que la conférence est, est enregistrée. Donc, je vous le répète. Je vais présenter notre conférence, mais je vais prendre mon ordinateur parce que je veux rien oublier. Donc aujourd'hui, on a la chance d'avoir le euh, docteur Thomas Paus, qui euh, vous avez sûrement déjà entendu parler de Dr. Paus. Euh, je vais le présenter en français, puisqu'on est euh, ici, mais euh, il va faire sa conférence en anglais. Euh, c'est vraiment un, un grand chercheur. Je suis vraiment très contente de l'avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, il, euh, maintenant, on a aussi la chance de l'avoir à Montréal, donc depuis peu. Euh, il est professeur en psychiatrie et en neurosciences à l'Université de Montréal et chercheur au CHU Sainte-Justine. Donc, euh, euh, au cours des 20 premières années de ses, de ses activités scientifiques, il a travaillé sur l'organisation fonctionnelle et structurelle du cerveau humain en utilisant diverses approches, notamment des études de patients présentant des lésions cérébrales, euh, la neuroimagerie fonctionnelle et structurelle et la stimulation cérébrale. Au cours des 15 à 20 dernières années, ses travaux ont intégré l'épidémiologie, les neurosciences et la génétique euh, à travers une nouvelle discipline qu'on appelle les neurosciences populationnelles. C'est ce dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui. Et vous allez voir, c'est, c'est vraiment fascinant. Euh, euh, dans la poursuite des connaissances pertinentes pour la santé du cerveau des enfants et des adolescents. Donc, euh, il s'intéresse à des populations plus pédiatriques. Cette recherche s'appuie sur des données acquises dans un certain nombre de cohortes basées en Amérique du Nord et euh, en Amérique du Sud, puis en Europe. Donc, il y a beaucoup de collaborations internationales. Je vais enlever mon masque parce que je suis la misère à vous parler. Euh, donc, euh, les travaux qu'il a publiés euh, ont, euh, ont vraiment été bien accueillis là, par les pairs parce qu'ils ont été cités plus de 58 000 fois dans d'autres publications. Euh, en 2013, euh, Springer a publié le livre Popula- « euh, Population Neuroscience euh, » qui, qui a écrit. Et euh, il a reçu aussi le prestigieux prix euh, Wilson de la Société royale du Canada, la médaille d'or de l'Université euh, Masaryk en République tchèque, puis il est membre du euh, International Neuropsychology Symposium. Il est rédacteur en chef adjoint de Human Brain Mapping and Social Neuroscience, puis il est membre de vraiment plusieurs comités consultatifs euh, un peu partout euh, ici en Europe et euh, ben, partout dans le monde. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup d'être ici. Et bonne conversation. Thank you, Anne. Wow, it's really amazing that you exist. Because, because, uh, you 
imagine uh, until today it's been always looking into my computer and seeing you there but you are here it's wonderful and uh, it's my first lecture in person lecture since february last year so uh it's really special thank you for asking me to come i'm sorry i don't speak french good enough to convey what i have to say to you in your mother tongue but maybe it'll happen one day uh, so uh what i will try to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to tell you about population neuroscience of the developing brain but but because it's the first lecture since february 2020 I changed the title a little bit. Oh, it's not working again. Ooh, we'll see. It's, oh, it's working now. So the title will be Looking for Trees in the Forest, Finding Knowledge in Big Data. That was the title I, I was given actually for a lecture in February last year uh, at the International uh, Neuropsychological Society in Denver. And, and people liked it, so hopefully you will like it. What I will do is I will start with a little bit of history. Uh, I'll talk about power of observation from single cases to groups. And, and I think you do need a little bit of history because most of you were born in this century. And as one of my students says, when she talks about other papers, she always says, oh, it's from the last century. I'm from the last century. And so I'll give you a little bit of that history there. And then I'll, I'll briefly go into the forest of data, because we have lots of data in the kind of studies that I do. And, uh, but most of my lecture I'll spend on telling you about uh, the developing brain, how, how the forest of data that is available to us, how we go into that forest and, and look for the trees that, that explain uh, brain development and brain maturation. So power of observation, starting uh, with single cases, right? And so most of you, even though you are from this century, uh, I hope you know who that person is. Mm -hmm. She was my mentor, Brenda Milner, and uh, we celebrated her 103rd birthday this, this July. She's very much with it. And uh, she still has incredible power of observation. So when we spoke uh, in July, uh, she asked me the right questions, given the fact that I was just about to or I just moved back to Montreal. And of course, that power of observation of uh, phenomena that others might have missed uh, was something that, uh, of course, gave her incredible insight into first PD and later HM, and, and uh, gave her insights about how mesial temporal lobe structures are important for memory, what kind of memory. And, uh, and that was really the beginning from the 50s, the beginning of extremely rich journey uh, of, of Dr. Milner and her students. And some of you may be uh, a journey about how the brain uh, instantiates memory. Uh, but uh, Brenda always said that single cases are interesting. They inspire you, but you have to, to do the hard work. And the hard work is going into the group. And being at the Montreal Neurological Institute, of course, her source of patients were neurosurgeries and uh, the information that she had about where, the, uh, where, where she is in the brain came from drawings made by neurosurgeons who told her where they removed the brain tissue and how much of it they removed. And then systematically for decades, uh, uh, her group was really uh, fine-tuning, verifying, and discovering uh, different aspects of, uh, again, how memory is instantiated in the brain. As I said, of course, she had to rely on drawings uh, by neurosurgeon. And, and that, of course, brings me to the second very important discovery. Again, looking, but now looking inside the body. Of course, we can't imagine now the world without magnetic resonance imaging, but before the 70s, uh, we didn't have it. And so roughly in the early 70s, Peter, uh, Peter Mansfield in Nottingham and a few others uh, also in the States uh, came up with new ways to use uh, magnetic resonance imaging for imaging human bodies. Uh, there you see Peter Mansfield at the top and then 
behind the scanner there that they made in Nottingham and Peter, uh, Peter Morris, the current head of the uh, MR Center was then, I guess, the PhD student in the 70s of, of uh, Mansfield. And you can see the brain that they scanned. It was, of course, post-mortem brain, and it doesn't look much like a brain. And that's at the top right. My cursor is not working, so I can't point. Uh, and actually, the heart uh, looks much more like a heart in, in the cross-section of the body there. You can see the arms, you see the heart. And, and one of the, uh, the inventions of Mansfield and his colleagues was EPI, echoplanar imaging. So imaging something fast, and that's what you need to do if you are imaging an organ that moves. Uh, brain, in that sense, it's boring. It doesn't move. Uh, when you play a video clip of a brain, you see nothing. When you see the beating heart, that's amazing, I can tell you that. So that was a single organ, sing, single observation. In fact, the technology, of course, developed. You can see the, the comparison here of scans of, an, of, of, of a brain right in the middle. That was in the mid 90s that the neuro and a postdoc went into the scanner 27 times and we averaged the brain. So we gained a lot of signal. Or you go to high field, seven Tesla in Nottingham, 2005, you see incredible amount of uh, details of brain structure, and, and we are not talking about uh, function yet. But again, like with uh, neuropsychology and Dr. Milner, we then go into the group when we start averaging. And again, in the early 90s, when we started using PET in blood flow activation studies, we needed to know exactly where we are in the brain and so on. And Lance and his group started, in fact, collecting MRIs uh, on a Philips 1.5 Tesla that we averaged in order to create a template that, that was registered with a known atlas, Talarak and Trunum. Uh, and the PET images were registered to uh, those MRI images. So you have here the average brain, 305 student, McGill students mostly. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see that it's, it's very blurry, right? Uh, well, that's because the scans were not of great quality. These were two millimeter thick slices. Uh, and uh, also the registration was done in a linear way. So you, you of course, all the, the variation from one person to another would blur the image. And then fast forward a uh, few years later, when we started doing uh, our work in the Southern IU study, that's the first 800 teenagers. Now we are acquiring images, in fact, on one Tesla scanner, not even 1.5, but with one millimeter isotropic resolution and registering them in a non-linear way. And you can see now that you, 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 you can appreciate at least some of the structure as compared with the MNI 305. And, and you know, maybe those of you who do fMRI, you know of MNI or ICPM 152, it's basically, well, it's the second generation of, of those scans that were registered to MNI 305. So that's averaging brain structure. Uh, now, we can also average, of course, brain function. So we registered those images, in this case, fMRI images of individuals taken when they were viewing faces, video clips of faces. Uh, it's the beginning of one of the large studies that I'm involved in. In this case, it's 1,000 over 1,000 teenagers. Uh, the images are registered again in the same standardized stereotactic space. And then uh, the probabilistic maps that are telling us what is the population probability of seeing a response to a face uh, in you know, percentage here uh, uh, is projected onto the surface uh, of the brain and, and, and displayed in this way. So you see the left hemisphere on the left, right on the right. Uh, and uh, there are two conditions that we, uh, we implemented there, either looking at ambiguous faces that's at the top or angry faces at the bottom. You can see two basic phenomena. One, that the right hemisphere seems to be more interested in faces than the left. Neuropsychologists would have told you that. And you also see that looking at ambiguous faces seems to be engaging the brain more than looking at the angry faces. Basically, the brain seeing the, the angry face says, OK, angry face, not interested any longer. Uh, looking at the ambiguous face, the brain is trying to figure out what's going on. And it seems that that, that of course, means uh, more, if you like, activation. 
but you can bring into standardized stereotoxic space also lesions. And, and here is a probabilistic map of lesions that uh, underlie facial recognition deficit in, or deficit in facial recognition tests. And you can see again, it's the right hemisphere that, uh, that, uh, that uh, if you have a lesion there, there is more impairment than when uh, a lesion is in the same location of the left hemisphere. Again, we know that right from a long, long time ago, but it's nice to see it quantified here. And of course, you see certain regions that, that we would have predicted, including at the bottom right, uh, the fusiform face area, but other uh, temporal, posterior temporal cortex, etc. So bottom line, you go from a single acquisition to a group, and in that group, you do your statistics. So uh, I, I'll come back to it uh, at the very end. I just wanted to impress on you that, of course, uh, knowledge can be uh, acquired at all different levels, uh, but it really starts and ends with, well, starts with an observation, ends with the interpretation of that observation. Whether we make that observation in a single case or in a group or in a population, that's a matter of taste to some extent and, and a matter of what you are interested in. So let me move to uh, forest of data. Uh, the reason I'm interested in this approach and have been doing it in this particular way for the past almost 20 years is that uh, I, I'm interested uh, in, in, in understanding the inter-individual variability uh, in behavior in general, but in particular as it relates to mental health. And why mental health? This slide illustrates that almost 50% of years lost to disability are due to psychiatric disorders. Why? For three reasons. Why? Uh, one, uh, those disorders such as depression, drug use, anxiety are highly prevalent in the population. So prevalence is one reason. The second reason is that they last for a long period of time, sometimes for the entire life. So it's not you break your bone, it heals, and you forget about it, unfortunately, with many psychotic disorders, they stay more or less with you for a long period of time. And the third one that is most interesting for me from developmental point of view is that 50% of those disorders begin by the age of 14, uh, the rest 75% by about the age of 24. So really, psychotic disorders are disorders of brain development. That's what many would argue. And so, of course, then uh, what you want to know is what shapes brain development. And there are only two possibilities, right? Genes and environment and their interplay, their interaction. That may start before conception and uh, goes on uh, for the rest of our lives. And of course, you understand the complexity of the human brain. Now add to it the complexity of genes and even greater complexity of different environmental influences, whether it's physical, build, social environment, what have you. And, and that's why we thought taking lessons from genetics of complex traits, you really need to have fairly large numbers to, to, to get some leverage over that complexity. And that's where population neuroscience comes in as a combination of three disciplines, two that have to do with exposures, if you like. So epidemiology typically deals with external exposures, genetics or omic sciences with, if you like, internal exposures. And then the outcome for me is the brain. So neuroimaging is really providing us with the measures that are relatively uh, uh, close to the ultimate outcome, which is behavior. So that's, that's how, popular, how uh, we, we think of population neuroscience. And of course, neuroimaging is an incredibly powerful tool that can be applied on such a large scale. Uh, you take a cohort, you push that cohort through a scanner, you, you acquire images, and then you use different computational tools to extract many different phenotypes, measures from those images, whether the images are structural or functional. I work with both, but I put more money into structural images because they have my much higher test feed test reliability. They cover evenly the whole brain because with the paradigm test of fMRI, you measure only what you activate, right? Whereas uh, different structural sequences uh, cover really evenly the entire brain. 
And most importantly, the structure is not static. It also changes, but it changes in a way that, uh, that is, I think, relevant to, of course, experience and plasticity. Today, I'll be speaking more on, in fact, the early phase of brain development that, that is, of course, affected also by environment, but a big chunk of it is, uh, uh, of course, coded or, uh, or is, is driven by a, a, a program, genetic program. And there are many different cohorts that are available nowadays. I'll, I'll be talking really only now. Uh, I'll give you a sense of how we designed the Sargon AU study, but then I will give you the examples about brain development will be from uh, our work with two international consortia uh, where we have access to tens of thousands of uh, MRIs and genetic data sets. So, Sagan AU study, we started with my wife, Dr. Pausova. We started it almost 20 years ago in, in Sagan, Shikutimi, Jonkier, the, the two uh, main cities and, and around. Uh, and when we were starting it, one of the reasons uh, was that, uh, you know, that it's a foundry population. So, uh, if you are interested in genetics of complex traits, especially 20 years ago, uh, it was a great advantage to work with uh, a population that is genetically a bit more homogeneous than uh, populations of Toronto or Montreal. So that was one of the motivations why, why we set up uh, the study there. But we were lucky that we had very good collaborators uh, who worked with uh, the education system, with high schools, who opened the door for us to be recruiting high school students in Saguenay. So at the end, over the 20 years, we have acquired data in over 1,000 adolescents. I'll show you the design uh, that came from 480 families. We had two or more siblings per family. We also had the biological parents. Uh, so everything that we have done in wave one was done deep phenotyping in the adolescents, some phenotyping and genotyping in the parents. Later, we were funded to repeat the deep phenotyping also in the parents, so we, we were able to bring back about 70% of the parents. And right now, we are back uh, bringing back the adolescents who are your age and older, I guess, uh, mid, mid late 20s, early 30s, and they are going through very similar protocol again, so it's the first follow-up. Now, uh, at that time, we were interested in adversity, early adversity, and we were looking for something that uh, at that time was fairly common and uh, uh, in, in a developed country and uh, was fairly common as an adversity during pregnancy. And that's why we settled on maternal smoking during pregnancy. And that's the exposure here. And we matched the exposed, well, the non-exposed to exposed by maternal education and the school that they attended to minimize differences in socioeconomic status between the two groups of individuals. I won't be talking today about uh, what, what the smoking during pregnancy is related to, but we published quite a bit, both on the brain side and the body side. And, and these are the review papers uh, that <coughs> with, the, with the overview of the study. But, but really, I'm using it only as an illustration of a study that is set up without a single specific hypothesis. It's not your experimental study that you are used to setting up in your lab, running 20 individuals, finding something, and then redesigning the hypothesis and going and doing something else. You can't do it uh, this way. You have to, uh, you know that it will take years to collect the data. So uh, you have to be broad and uh, at the, sometimes at the expense of D. Nonetheless, if you have a good cohort of individuals who collaborate uh, with you, you can collect a lot of data. So our study starts with, uh, of course, going to schools, uh, getting permission to contact uh, families and the individuals, and then setting up uh, uh, a call with the nurse uh, who collects the basic information about eligibility, eventually goes to the home uh, where we, she, she collects a lot of data using questionnaires plus blood sample of the parents. Then the kids come to a school lab where they had six hours of neuroscience testing, so a lot of cognitive data that we have collected. Then they come to the hospital every Saturday for MRI, cardiovascular detailed protocol, 24-hour uh, 
uh, uh, food recall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we go to school to them again. We take blood sample in the morning, so it's a fasting blood sample, and also we can look at hormones. Uh, and you know that hormones fluctuate during 24 hours, so that's why we want to do it always more or less at the same time around 9 a.m. And then we can start analyzing data. So you can imagine that it took a while to do all this. Now, just very, uh, uh, to give you a sense for it, so we develop a database that each of the instruments, as we call them, be it a questionnaire, a scan, a cardiovascular protocol, uh, they are entered, uh, all the data, the, the names that you see on the left, uh, match the names that are in those publications. So you can look at the date, they are also matching uh, standard operating procedures protocols on the website, so you have to be organized for it. And then each instrument uh, has all the variables. And, and here I'm giving an example from one paper to be published five years ago now uh, about something that we did not think about at all uh, at the beginning of the study. It turns out that when we scan the brain, we basically got the whole skull. And so then uh, I don't even remember how that question came about, but uh, we realized we can actually measure the voice box. We can measure how long it is. Uh, we can measure different uh, track length, the, the, the vocal folds, and we recorded uh, voices of those uh, uh, kids uh, in a particular task. So we could uh, then analyze acoustics of that voice and relate it to the development of the voice box. Right, and, and, and learn something about uh, puberty and especially in boys, obviously the voice changes and, and how those things are related. So there are thousands of variables like this. Now, this is just don't, uh, no need to read this. Uh, different domains that we covered, the different variables, and for one review paper, we put it all together and simply quantified sex differences. And, and you see the effect size in the fourth column, I think, there uh, ordered from uh, larger in males versus females to at the bottom, uh, uh, larger or higher, in this case, fundamental frequency uh, in females compared with males. So when you look at it overall across 60, 66 traits, you see that there are large effect sizes for some traits, medium for other, and quite a few small effect sizes. Now, what we did with this, uh, we decided, okay, we have all those traits, let's calculate a sex score across all those, because of course we know that there is an overlap between males and females, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear. Height is a good example of it, right? There are tall women and short guys. So uh, we calculated the score, score that we can call uh, basically masculinity and femininity score. And so now we ask whether within a given sex, let's say in females, whether if you are more on the feminine side versus more masculine side, side if you're still a, a female, whether that relates to, uh, for example, psychological traits like ADHD. And it does. So uh, a female with higher masculinity score is more likely to show symptoms of ADHD. So, so that gets at the continuous nature of sex differences. So that's one example of what, how you can take advantage of the multiple traits that cover multiple domains. But let me now get to uh, really the, the, the part that I promised uh, today. So now three vignettes uh, about brain development. Let me start by just pointing out to you the obvious that the cerebral cortex, uh, the gray and white matter, is really more than 80% of uh, brain mass. That's really where the tissue is. Uh, it contains, of course, lots of neurons, 16 billion or so, even more glial cells. Uh, notice that cerebellum is the other way around, right? Uh, there are more neurons than glial cells. And uh, what I will do today, I will now look at two very simple metrics, but very different ones that we can extract uh, using from MRI images using PreServer. Many of you know about the tool. Uh, I can measure the total surface area of the cortex, or I can measure the thickness of the cortex. Okay? So we'll start with the surface area. Now, what's interesting about surface area is that 
obviously, like the whole brain, it grows a lot prenatally, and then the next two years uh, postnatally. You see, it goes up. I mean, cortical gray matter is is good proxy here of basically uh, the surface area. You see that it doubles from mid gestation to birth, uh, almost doubles, well, 150 percent, and then it goes to about 300 uh, percent of the mid gestation by the age of two, and then it doesn't change much. And that's important to keep in mind because it means that when I measure surface area in the adult brain. And if I were to do it here for all of us, basically it will be very, very strongly related or almost the same as it was in my case almost 60 years ago. Okay. So it's frozen in time. And that allows me to ask questions about development, very early development processes that underlie that growth. I don't need to necessarily measure uh, the brain size or the surface area at at birth, I can make inferences, as I will show you, uh, about the development processes from looking at inter-individual inter variation uh, in the adult brain. Okay, so how did we do that? We, that's one of the consortium, a consortia that we worked with, Charge. We had access to, uh, well, uh, over 20,000 actually in this case, uh, MRI scans. And uh, we were doing this work in parallel with the groups in Enigma who published uh, at about the same time a nice science paper that uh, showed that basically it was meta GVAS of each of surface area of each of those 34 regions that you see here that surface three surface segments. The brain is one of the parcellations. You can do it in many other ways, but that's the most common one, Desikan Kilani Atlas that segments the brain, the cortex, into 34 regions per hemisphere. What we decided to do, instead of going one by one, we asked first which regions grow together. So we just run principal component analysis on the surface area of those 34 regions. And that basically gave us two top components, VC1, VC2, and we did the MetaGVAS genome-wide association study only on those two components. Now, let me show you first the first component. By definition, it captures most of that growth. As you can see, all those red regions are growing more or less together. And when I uh, ask the question which genes or genetic variations are associated with those variations, I can see a lot of uh, hits on this Manhattan plot, in particular on chromosome 17, uh, as you can see. And you can read about this uh, later. I don't. I mean, this is not uh, the interesting part of the story. But the interesting part, especially for those who are interested in the visual cortex, uh, is PC2. As you can see, for some reason, you notice it probably right here, the visual cortex was blue, right, on the PC1. Well, now it's red for PC2. So the visual or pericalcarine cortex seems to grow differently from the rest of the cortex. So that's why it's loading very high on a separate principal component. So when we run now uh, the meta GVAS on this component, the PC2 that you see here, we get very different molecular architecture. And the very interesting gene that I highlighted here is the one on chromosome 14. It's a gene that is called uh, the Chevelle associated activator of morphogenesis. It's part for the, uh, of, of the planar uh, cell polarity pathway. Essentially, it's a mechanism that tells the cell, this is your front, this is your back, that's where you need to go, right? That's the polarity uh, mechanism. It's a, a typical developmental gene. When is it expressed? When we look at the human cerebral cortex, we see that it's expressed during mid gestation. By the time we are born, there is virtually almost nothing left in terms of the expression. You see? So here we are using adult data, adult uh, surface area, variation in surface area, and we are pulling out a gene that, uh, that did something way before we were born in mid gestation. And I find this fascinating, right? Uh, and it tells you that it depends what your phenotype is doing, when it's actually being formed. It doesn't matter when you scan it, right? 
and, and this is a very good, uh, good case for that, and I'll give you one at the very end. Now, what does it do? Most likely, it's related, of course, uh, Pashko Rakic explained to us uh, through the radio unit hypothesis that essentially more ontogenetic columns you have, the larger surface area you would have. And, and those cells are then migrating up, but that migration is influenced through thalamo, uh, thal uh, thalamic radiation, right? Now, what's, what's special about the visual cortex? Well, it's connected to the eye. So if I take out the eye before birth, the visual cortex is, it shrinks or it's smaller by one third. So clearly, even though I'm still in the womb, that was done, of course, in non-human primates. Uh, if I'm still in the womb, I don't see anything, uh, right? Not much. Uh, certainly, the retina is influencing how my visual cortex grows. And that's probably, you may know of Carla Schatz and the retinal spontaneous waves uh, of activation that are driving through LGN, driving the development of the visual cortex. So that's probably what's happening. Now, does it mean anything for a psychologist? Well, I mean, I, I'm kind of an anatomist, boring guy in that sense. Uh, you, you want to know uh, what, uh, what does it do in terms of function? Well, you can think of it as uh, essentially larger visual cortex arguably may have more units and higher fidelity. It's a high definition TV screen, if you like, right? Now, if that's true, then, uh, then of course, uh, uh, an object is represented by uh, a larger number of neurons. You get that uh, higher definition, the difference between the two images there, right? And we do know, again, from monkey studies, that there is a relationship between the size of V1 and visual acuity that's illustrated on this plot, uh, and not only between diurnal and nocturnal monkeys, but also even within for example, the diurnal monkeys, there is a bit of a trend. But what's also interesting, it's not only about visual acuity, it's also true about the visual illusion. Yeah? Why? Well, because maybe the blurring of those flanking uh, elements is not as bad if you have high definition visual cortex, right? And you can see those with the larger visual cortex have weaker illusion. And, and the last one there uh, underneath weak is humans, and, and there are other monkeys that are going down towards the strong. So visual illusion is a good example. Now, I was thinking, okay, can I get something about the visual abilities of the participants in the genetic study so I can make that link to the size of the visual cortex? And obviously, uh, no, uh, because those studies come from many different cohorts. They had other priorities than to do psychophysics of vision, right? But, but UK Biobank uh, has occupation data. And someone smart in the US government a long time ago, not, not, not current or the, the previous one, uh, established, in fact, uh, a, a Dictionary of Occupational Titles. They went and observed thousands of different professions, what they do. And then they classified different abilities, including form perception. So what we did in the UK Biobank, we matched the codes of the professions from this dictionary that told us the degree in which a particular profession uh, requires, for example, form perception, right? And we related it then uh, to the size of uh, the primary visual cortex. And this is just an example of uh, high or low abilities uh, in that domain of form perception. You can see that the high is microbiologists looking uh, under the microscope for details. The low is uh, those who make airplanes, which is a bit scary, but uh, some sort of big things that, that you don't have to see a detail, right? And the effects that we found were tiny, but they were significant and in the predicted direction. So those who held professions after we corrected for general abilities, because of course, microbiologists would be typically more educated. So we had to take care of that. 
But once we took care of that, we did see that those uh, who uh, have professions requiring uh, better form perception had larger, ever so slightly, but larger visual cortex. Now, uh, of course, in this case, because what I told you about when the visual cortex grows, clearly it was not the consequence of uh, having that profession. It was one little uh, element that pushed that individual towards choosing that profession that his or her brain might have been particularly good at, right? But obviously, tiny amount of variance explained its proof of principle. So I'll come back to surface area towards the end, but let's switch gears now and talk about the other metrics, and that's uh, the thickness of the cortex. Unlike surface area, thickness is much more dynamic. As you can see on this plot, uh, it really changes quite a bit during adolescence, childhood and adolescence. It actually goes down, then reaches a certain plateau, and then it starts going down a little bit uh, also after about the age of 65. Now, we don't know in detail what, what underlies that change, but I'll, I'll talk about it in a, in a minute. But remember, thickness is dynamic. Now, what we decided to do is to work with Enigma, another consortium, and work with uh, different working groups uh, uh, that focus on psychiatric disorders, because what we wanted to know was uh, what are the neurobiological underpinnings of group differences in cortical thickness between, let's say, patients with schizophrenia and controls, patients with ADHD and controls. So the first thing that we did, uh, we, uh, we recruited all those working groups. We ended up at the end working with about 140 cohorts, a total of about 20,000 individuals. Uh, we sent them, my PhD student, Yash Patel, sent the scripts uh, how to analyze the data. We are not asking for the data to come to us. We asked for the summary statistics to come to us. We meta-analyzed those summary statistics to get the average group difference for each of the six disorders. And then we do what we call virtual histology. So let me tell you first, what we see and then I'll tell you about virtual histology. So that's, that's the group difference. For each of those six disorders, you see how many we had in each, uh, for each uh, disorder. You see also two things. One, that some disorders show very little difference and maybe surprisingly, you see ADHD doesn't show that much of a difference, uh, right, from zero, which would mean no difference between controls and cases. Some disorders such as schizophrenia show a very large difference. But the other thing that I will come back to is that you notice that there, is, there are some similarities in the profile across those 34 regions, right? So we go from, I think, front to back, yes, front to low, uh, tem parietal, temporal, occipital, right? So there are some undulations that, that look similar, and I'll come back to it. But first, I need to tell you about the neurobiology. One of my frustrations over the past uh, 30 years with imaging uh, is that uh, we don't know what it means. We get all those signals, uh, especially, you know, say, magnetization, transfer ratio, fractional anisotropy, this and that. And we don't know what the neurobiology is. Uh, and as an anatomist, I would like to slice up the brain and get at least at a cellular level and to know which cells are contributing to the differences that I see in those MRI signals. Obviously, I cannot do that. So we developed a, a technique that gets around it and we call it uh, virtual histology that allows us to get some sense of which of those cells that I'm showing you on this slide might be contributing to the differences that we see on the MRI scan, uh, differences in the cerebral cortex. How do we do that? We use gene expression data from the Allen Human Brain Atlas that covers the entire cerebral cortex. Uh, we have uh, summarized the data so that we have the mean for expression for all genes for each of the 34 regions. And we also uh, go through two filters to uh, work only with genes that show consistent profiles because it's only six donor brains. So, uh, so the first, of course, problem that you have is, is it representative of the population? Because we'll be relating these data 
to the data that we acquired in completely different individuals. So if the atlas is not representative, then uh, there is no point in doing. It. So we, we've gone through those filters. And then the second thing that we did, we took data, single cell RNA data that tell us from this paper by Zizel that tell us which genes are specific for which cells. And, and he uh, came up, they came up with uh, those uh, panels of marker genes for nine main cell types that you see on the screen there. And we intersected those panels with uh, the consistency filters that we did. So we have at the end about 100 uh, marker genes per cell type. And then the way that we bring the data together is through spatial correlation. Of course, we don't correlate across individuals because we have MRI in one set of individuals and gene expression, because it's post-mortem, right, in another set of individuals. So we bring it together by correlating those two sets of values across the 34 regions. So the dots that you see on this plot, each dot is a region, not a person, right? And here I'm showing you on the left is the spatial distribution of cortical thickness. In the middle is the spatial distribution of the expression of one particular gene, it happens to be gene specific to astrocytes. And then on the right, I'm showing you how the two metrics correlate uh, in space. And now I repeat it for about 1000 genes that I know are specific for, for the different nine cell types. And I ask, uh, uh, now I relate it, of course, to the profile of the group differences. And I ask which of those genes profiles, interregional profiles of gene expression are similar to the group differences, to the profile of group differences that I'm showing you here across the same 34 regions. And when we do that, what stands out is the second column in particular, uh, genes that are specific to so-called CA1 pyramidal cells. I can tell you more uh, about it later. In short, uh, pyramidal cells with very nice branching, dendritic branching. Those seem to be related to the profiles across all the disorders. Microglia and astrocytes are also similar. So in fact, uh, again, we are going back to the similarity of those profiles of group differences that I pointed out to you. So let's quantify them through principal component analysis. The PC1 now represents the commonality of those interregional profiles of group differences. And not surprisingly, again, those pyramidal cells relate very strongly with that common profile of group differences. So something very similar, in other words, something very similar is going on across the six disorders when it comes to how thick the different cortical regions are, and that something uh, relates to pyramidal cells plus other types. So the final step was we wanted to know what other genes are co-expressed with those specific uh, genes the pyramidal genes that are related to the principal component one. And, and we went to five different data sets now of gene expression, carried out the gene expression across those 570 brains and discovered that they are basically two clusters of uh, genes that are co-expressed with our target genes. One cluster of genes that is mostly expressed before birth, they are the turquoise uh, genes, as you can see here, and another cluster of about 200 genes that are expressed mostly postnatally. And then we ask, okay, what do they do, those genes? And you can uh, run so-called gene ontology that tells you what processes are involved, those genes are involved in, and not surprisingly, the prenatal genes are mostly involved in brain development, axon development, regulation of uh, neuron projections, axon guidance, etc. But the postnatal are all about neurotransmission and plasticity. So basically the bottom line, uh, the differences in group differences in cortical thickness are about both the early brain development, but also what those brains have been doing since they were born. Right? And, and it's a very interesting now of course, question of what it is, 
postnatally that is shaping those brains and what can we do postnatally obviously uh, once we have patient with this or that disorder or someone at risk of that disorder what can we do to actually prevent uh, the decrease in cortical thickness because most likely it's not a good thing right even though we don't know 100 percent i mean the, the signs are not that clear cut okay so let me finish up with a few more slides now uh, bringing together the two metrics surface area and cortical thickness in the context of psychopathology and cognition in another large data set and that's the ABCD study and I'm going to show you data that come from the first wave about one eight thousand ten year old children right you know the study is going on in the states they are now probably waiting for the third wave I suppose the second must have been finished well with COVID I don't know actually uh, so second wave must have been finished by now so what we did, uh, looking at psychopathology, we used a slightly different approach uh, than, than people typically do. Uh, we used by factor confirmatory factor analysis of child behavior checklist data that is allowing us to extract so-called P factor, which is something that cuts across different symptoms, different disorders. It's kind of general psychopathology, if you like. And then there are those two more specific internalizing and externalizing symptoms. I won't be talking about that. And we simply ask across the 34 regions, are, uh, is there a variation in how different properties of those regions relate to P factor psychopathology? So we simply correlate P factor with surface area, thickness, and a few other metrics uh, for each region and again plot the profile. And as you can see here, it's very clear cut. Absolutely no relationship with thickness, almost no, right, at the bottom. A very strong relationship with surface area. In other words, kids with lower surface area are much more likely to have high P factor, more psychopathology. And yes, there is some undulation on, on that profile. And I can tell you that they are, and this paper is just has been just accepted. So uh, we, we measured also, uh, we looked at a few other metrics and, and there was nothing either. So it's really the surface area stands out. But then we asked, what about general cognition? And we took the, uh, the, the common cognition from NIH toolbox, and that's what you see. Obviously the opposite. Again, no relationship, almost no relationship, a few regions uh, with thickness, but mostly surface area. Kids with higher surface area have higher cognitive abilities. And it goes, it's, it's exactly the same in males and females. Uh, so there are no, no sex differences in the nature of that relationship. And then finally we ask, uh, okay, uh, are those two profiles similar or not? So now we correlate the first profile that I showed you with this profile. And as you can see, they are highly related, right? So we can say that at least in terms of the relationship with, with surface area, uh, there is a relationship between psychopathology and cognition. But if I look simply at the relationship across individuals in psychopathology and cognition, we see very little. So it's more about how they relate to the brain than how they relate to each other. Now, the last two slides, and I'm sure I'm going too long, uh, but I'll give you those two, two more slides, which are typically half of my talk. So, but I, 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 I condensed it because I, I'm very excited about it, but I knew that I cannot have another half an hour for you. Uh, so surface area. Obviously, it's growing, as I told you, uh, before birth, in part after birth. So what we decided to do is to come up with a way that is parallel to what I explained to you uh, in terms of virtual histology. We call it virtual ontogeny. What we do uh, now, instead of using those genes from the Allen brain atlas, uh, the adult brain, we use genes from uh, essentially, uh, well, developing brain, from more or less second trimester, right? From the cortex, only 11 regions, because that's what's out there. 
And instead of uh, genes that are specific to those nine cell types, we uh, use single cell RNA data to identify genes that are specific to radial glia, remember the radial unit hypothesis, to intermediate progenitor cells, to end up, and then to a few dif differentiated cells, excitatory interneur uh, interneurons uh, and uh, endothelial and neural cells. And then we, we play the same trick. We just simply ask, is there a relationship, spatial relationship between the expression of those genes during second trimester and group differences in surface area between patients and controls? Pretty much the same cohorts that I showed you from the Enigma consortium. And when we do that, so that's the, the, the schematics is in the upper right corner, the results are in front of you. It's really the radial glia and the intermediate progenitor cells that, uh, that drive those, that show those relationships. Regions that have more of those, uh, more expression of those specific genes, the genes of the undifferentiated cells, radial glia and RBCs, those regions show bigger differences between controls and patients. And in fact, the opposite is true about the differentiated excitatory, to some extent also endothelial and neural cells. So it's telling us that something that is acting through the radial glia and intermediate progenitor cells might be behind at least some of the differences between patients and controls in the early development of their cerebral cortex. Remember, again, we are looking at adult cerebral cortex, but we are learning something about looking back, uh, back, right? We are looking back to what was going on likely in those developing brains way before they were diagnosed with schizophrenia, right? Uh, second trimester. And the last slide, it brings it all together in that uh, we now ask, is there an intersection between genes that underlie different risk factors known to be increasing the risk of psychosis? They are at the top, hypoxia, birth weight, famine, stress, uh, perinatally, right? Between genes that, that uh, are associated with those risk factors and our genes. Uh, the suspect specific genes I just told you about. And as you can see, yes, but in very interesting way. So congenital mal malformations, birth weight and hypoxia genes intersect with the undifferentiated, undifferentiated cells, the radioglia and intermediate progenitor cells. Whereas in fact, maternal hypertension and preterm birth intersect with vasculature with genes that underlie vascular development. So in other words, there are at least two different paths that can lead to uh, underdeveloped uh, cerebral cortex that you can see here. And so conceptually, the way that I, I see both the virtual histology and virtual ontogeny, it's telling us that yes, those cells, whether it's the panel from virtual histology or the panel from virtual ontogeny are the instruments. They are the piano keys, but we need to look for the players. The players might be, for example, the risk factors. Uh, they may be environmental influences, other genes. They are the players that are playing on those piano keys, leading to a particular phenotype. First, uh, the brain that may be more vulnerable. Uh, if it's smaller, let's say, in terms of surface area, but it doesn't mean that you will develop a disorder because, of course, there are many other things that will uh, decide whether or not you will and which one. Because as you notice, uh, what I showed you, many of those disorders have in common and they are very different. ADHD and schizophrenia are very different. So there must be something very different down the line that or something that we, we haven't looked at because we don't have the tool that will determine that, right? 
So the reason I'm excited about population neuroscience is that it allows me to move across different levels. I didn't talk today about uh, the social level, but that's where we are pushing also in terms of aggregate level data, characterizing social environment, et cetera. So I think we'll be plugging it in uh, as well, but, but it's really a, a good platform for, for us to, to bring knowledge from different areas of, of neuroscience, developmental science to understand uh, what shapes the human brain. And I'll stop here by acknowledging a lot of people who helped, but the two uh, students, postdocs, who contributed a lot to the work that I presented today are India Yash Patel, who just defended his PhD, and Jean Shin is a research associate in my wife's lab at SickKids, and, and the two consortia are Charge and Enigma. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I just have like a little technical question. Um, for the study you did with charge, I, I was wondering how much of the variance was explained by the two first components of the PCA. Was it like 100%? No, no. no, not uh, at all. In fact, if I remember correctly, it's in the paper, but but it was not that much. Uh, even the PC1 maybe explained about 40, 45%, and PC2 maybe 8, uh, 10%. Okay. So not a lot. Uh, was there uh, any curve like the visual cortex um, with, that you can explain why they were not like related to the, the gene? Why not, they were not related to PC1? No, like for the PC2, mm -hmm. uh, you said it was mostly like the visual cortex, right? Right. And it was related to the a certain gene? Right, the um, arm one. Yeah, and do you know why? the other parts of the brain, uh, did you check if they were also, yeah? yeah. yeah. No, uh, we did, we did. And, and they, uh, there was, I think, one of the genes that was shared by PC1 and PC2 at the genome-wide significance level, yeah. but there, but certainly down one was not. So so that's a very good question. For example, down one, uh, if you paid attention to that one slide there, it's expressed in all cortical regions. It's not expressed only in the visual cortex. That would have been the easiest answer, right? So it's something else. That's why I'm emphasizing the potential interaction between, for example, the retinal waves and uh, that particular gene, because that would uh, make it uh, region specific. The expression, the presence of the gene is not region specific. So that's, you know, lots of questions that are left there uh, to answer. Yeah, good question. Uh, very, very good talk. Uh, I didn't know the difference between surface and thickness, I think that was a very, uh, very neat result. Um, you are mainly interested in structural uh, variables. Um, do you see the same future for population neuroscience, for functional MRI, maybe outside of resting state? Like, do you, because of course we're constrained by task when we're doing functional MRI. Uh, and what is your take on it? Do you think yeah, like, it would be worth it? Well, it can be done. Uh, we've done a little bit with, with the face task, for example, we used when we collected about 2,000 uh, teenagers. We run so called GCTA genome complex trait analysis that gives us estimates, SNP based estimates of heritability. And, and even that was already kind of telling how limited we are in terms of the phenotype, because we saw that. Those estimates, so we have those two tasks. And I think it's just an illustration of, of the potential challenges with any kind of fMRI data. I told you to start with, well, I told you that structure is more reliable, well, has high test retest, functional has low uh, test retest. So if you are interested in genetics, you want to have a stable trait. The same trait that I measured today, I would get the same value two weeks from now. And obviously, that's not going to be the case. It's not going to be the case for behavior, for cognition, right? So that's the first challenge that we have uh, if we are looking at, for example, genetic relationships, right? So in this particular study, uh, in, in this particular data set, we were able to estimate heritability only uh, for the data uh, from the ambiguous uh, part of the protocol. 
there was absolutely zero heritability estimated with that power of 2000 and that's the limit at the, at the sort of uh, threshold of, uh, of uh, feasibility uh, there was nothing okay that doesn't mean that it, it's not there but something in the data prevented us to pull it out and then we looked at the ambiguous and 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 we looked at which regions are showing heritability and which ones are not and it turned out that uh, regions that had either very high response to faces or low response to faces were not good. It was if you had a, a lot of population variance in the middle, then you were able to calculate the heritability. So also the distribution of data in the population, the strength of the signal is going to determine whether what kind of answer you are able to get not necessarily uh, what the true the truth is right uh, i think it, uh, enigma is working now uh, of course also developing pipelines for the functional not only resting state we'll see uh, we are contributing to some of it uh, it's happening now we'll see how robust results will get uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I have maybe two quick technical questions. One relates to the, uh, the atlas that you use. Like many of the studies I see is Jessica Michelliani atlas, uh, in particular for the JAMA psychiatry study. And so the granularity of that obviously is, is not great in terms of uh, special resolution. I mean, if you're looking at the gene expression, one might expect to want to go for much more specificity in terms of location. Is that a limitation in any way? And if so, why was it uh, done that way? Uh, we actually, it was our choice because in fact, uh, Alan Brain Atlas uh, has lots of different uh, probes uh, all over the cortex. So he summarized the data. He actually induced, he lowered the granularity from the original data, right? So I think that I haven't tested it, but I think that we hit a sweet spot where uh, many people are trying to do voxel-wise uh, type of analyses uh, relating transcriptomics to MRI signals. And, and I think that they are pushing it uh, too far that there is too much noise. So I, I, uh, I still think that uh, this somewhat arbitrary choice, uh, the default of free surfer of 34 regions, turn out to be a, 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 a good one, right? I mean, we need to test the uh, yeah. uh, Well, that's not a big deal. I mean, those numbers, I mean, you don't need a lot of computation. But I think the robustness of the profile. So, because that's the, I told you there, there are two filters. The first filter is we ask whether the, so we don't care, of course, about absolute values of gene expression in a given region. It would be all over the place. What we care about is whether the profile for a particular gene across, in this case, 34 regions, is similar across the six donors. And that was our first filter. If it was not similar, we got rid of that gene. And that dropped already from 20,000 to maybe 8,000. And then we had a second filter where we asked whether that mean profile from the Allen Brain Atlas was, it's only one woman, five men. Uh, adults. But it's similar to Brainspan Atlas, we had about 10 individuals there uh, from the age of 10 to 40, I think, half and half uh, male and female. And we took, we kept only the genes that showed similar profiles, I mean, statistically speaking, correlation coefficient that was significant uh, in the two atlases. And that dropped from, I think it's 8,000 to 2,500. So, so that's the main limitation of not enough transcriptomic data in a large enough sample of individuals that we are stuck, if you want to do, be careful and conservative, with only 25 genes we can interrogate. I think that's much bigger limitation than uh, resampling it to any other arbitrary number of regions. I would guess that in fact, if we uh, push the granularity to, to smaller parcels uh, and use the same filtering mechanism, we'll, we'll, we would uh, lose even more genes because there would be even less likely to show that spatial uh, profile. I, yeah, thank you. For it's that. a guess. Yeah. 
I was so one of the reasons my question was that, for example, when we do MEG with the, when we look at different atlases, if the data you have is not does not match nicely the specific because the the has makes some assumptions inherent why those exactly those. So if you don't go down to a voxel level, but stay, let's say at a homogeneous, so the same size. So if you if you do it homogeneously but with smaller patches. You, you have less assumptions yeah. on like how that would relate to that specific segmentation. I agree. And again, it's an empirical question because to some extent, you know, I mean, you know, the work of Zillas and others long time ago trying to, and he, he tried a while back also, uh, what's the relationship between, let's say, site architecture and south side? Uh, Zillas would say, oh, it's not perfect, uh, but there is some. So we do know that what's in front of the central surface is more and what is behind is some of the sensory. And so it may be actually useful to have parcels that are, at least in some cases, like the calcarine, like the central uh, auditory, etc., are more or less aligned with functional subdivisions rather than being completely independent of them by moving uh, the parcels kind of in agnostic way. Because we can imagine that, of course, uh, the genetic architecture of the primary visual cortex would be different from that of, you know, cortex that is three centimeters in front of it or, you know, but that's a gut feeling. I think that there is maybe some advantage to a parcelation that is, to some extent, related to how the brain has developed and uh, differentiated functionally. Yeah. But I don't know. If, if they're smaller, they can still capture that, right? Yes. yes. Because you'll see, for example, if you have five next yeah. to each other, Absolutely. they're the same size, they will fit in and they might conflict. Absolutely. And people do try to do that to see whether, in fact, there is a natural grouping that would all the voxels along, let's say, the central sulcus on one side will be this versus that. But I think we don't have enough data, again, the transcriptomic data to do it properly. And for the developmental data, it's even worse because you might have noticed on, on that slide that we have only, whoever if you counted the number of blobs there, we have only 11 regions. Because of course, when the anatomists or developmental biologists are taking out the samples from, you know, eight post-conception weeks or six post-conception weeks, well, they have to go by landmarks, right? Uh, how else would they know what cortex it is that they are sampling, right? So we have only, and, and then they have to, of course, uh, be reasonably confident that this landmark at eight post-conception is the same one, 12, and 14, et cetera, right? So that's a tough job. And, and so that's why we have only 11 regions, right? So a huge limitation in that sense, but the limitation is mostly the availability of data. I mean, the, the expression data. I, I have two small questions. Uh, the first one is more general. Um, it's about the, uh, the tiny youth study. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, because you said that you were uh, interested in the impact of early adversity on uh, neural development. And I was wondering, why did you choose to, to, um, to recruit high school uh, kids or adolescents instead of going into primary school yeah. or daycare yeah. school? Yeah. Yeah. Related to my sort of when I was growing up, when I was in high school, I worked in a psychiatric hospital, and I, as many uh, you know, uh, young people, were fascinated by this really strange condition called schizophrenia, and because uh, it's so striking, right, uh, what those brains are doing, and and we know that obviously schizophrenia does not begin in childhood uh, it, it really starts in young adulthood and, and that was and, and perhaps with something going on in this fairly dynamic uh, adolescent pubertal period and so that was the very non-scientific reason for me to be interested in the adolescent the developing brain of adolescents that also pragmatically at that time, for me, who has done, I, I did very little work in, in child, uh, child development for my PhD, a little bit. I, I felt much more comfortable uh, with young adults. 
And so it was also easier for me to take that knowledge that I had and, and push it by, you know, five, 10 years down rather than learning how to work with infants or mm. so okay. pragmatic. Yeah. Not, okay. not that I wouldn't, I, I think that obviously the first two years, as everyone is saying, and it's true, are fascinating and I think I will get to it, but uh, only now. You don't agree then. Yeah. yeah. And my, my last question is about the, um, I think it's in the ABCD studies, you showed um, the negative correlation between surface area and the uh, the, the factor of area and the positive correlation with cognition. Mm -hmm. And you said that there is no, the sex didn't impact this relationship. Um, but I was wondering, does the um, socioeconomic status have an impact on this relationship? I, I am asking because yeah. we have we have a lot of, um, the SES have a big impact in all on our courts and I'm struggling with that. Yeah, no, no, uh, absolutely. I, I don't think that, uh, uh, I mean, that's, you know, the question of poverty is, of course, a very important one in terms of brain, uh, the early brain development. I don't think that we, we split the sample along those lines. Uh, I don't think that we use uh, uh, SES, some measure of SES as a confounder. So it's there, but I cannot answer that question. And, uh, I mean, it's easy to check. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, I'm sure there is another a student, no, yeah, she's gone. <laughs> so, you know how it is with PhD students. <laughs> so, but it's, it's a good question, of course. We did check uh, because there is uh, there is an ethnicity mix, and and we did check that, and it's the same. So it's not certainly related to ethnicity, for example, which to some extent is uh, in the states in particular uh, uh, somewhat different in SES also, but but at that course level, it's not. Okay, that's it. Yeah. 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 Those questions. Thank you very much, very, very much. And he, he came from Toronto. Uh, he is coming to Toronto today. He returns this evening. So he is here just for the conference. Thank, thank you very yeah. much for coming no here in Montreal for uh, yes. your talk. Thank you for very coming. Very thank you. Pendant 5 à 7, là, il y a du vin, euh, des, euh, des chips, je pense, ou euh, des, des petits trucs. Donc, euh, tout le monde est, est bienvenu à rester pour euh, boire un verre et discuter.